I just really enjoy looking after plants and I really enjoy I love the fact that you've got these teensy little seeds you know look at them you just imagine a little seed and then you, you germinate it and the next thing you know boom you've got this amazing plant now the translation of a tiny seed into an amazing plant is incredible and the next thing you know you've got fruit and then you're back to seeds it's just uh, it's just incredible I, I love that this is the deep in the weeds podcast i'm anthony huckstep as we've seen through the series drought bushfires and the pandemic have had a monumental impact on farming in australia those working the land have had almost every reason to throw their hands in the air and give up but in typical Australian fashion, they've simply rolled up the sleeves, got stuck in, and weathered whatever has been thrown at them. The result is some of the best produce in the world, because our farmers are innately connected to, and concerned with, the land and what it's capable of producing. Julie Anderson is the owner of Parksburn Produce in regional New South Wales. Julie, thanks for joining us. Well, it's um, it's um, it's lovely to, to speak with you. I um, I don't know. Though I feel quite honoured. You know, there's nothing really all that special about what we do here. I don't think. But anyway, I'll, I'll let others be the judge of that. Julie, can you tell us about Parksburn Produce and and what you do there? Um, well, we uh, grow kind of special specialist fruits mainly. Um, they're very soft fruits. Uh, they're not fruits that you come across in the supermarket at all. Um, they're kind of kind of rare, hard to hard to come by, um, and some are, are extremely rare because I import the seeds and, and grow some things from seeds. It takes quite a quite a, um, a a bit of time, but um, I just love doing that. I think it's really really cool to to introduce really unusual tastes and looks to the um, to the food landscape, I guess. Yeah, so um, mainly things like alpine strawberries, um, which are incredibly fragrant and quite a beautiful strawberry. Um, I also grow other species of strawberries, um, such as the Virginian strawberries. Um, and also Chilean strawberries. Um, a lot of those are still in the experimental patches at the moment. Uh, musk strawberries, uh, which are another different species, as well as some specialist um, hybrid strawberries like pineberries and strasberries. All of these are really soft fruits, so no one really wants to do them in commercial scale because they're incredibly difficult to pick and grow. You know, the alpine strawberries, there's 700 in a kilo for a start. So, you know, it's a, it's a bit of an effort. And then, you know, with the raspberries, why why just have red? I grow pink and gold and black and blue and purple. Because, just because they're wonderful. You, you mentioned that uh, people don't grow them in a sort of large commercial <laughs> sense, uh, industrial. Do you... Can you tell us what the challenges are involved in growing these soft fruits? Um, well, got um, shit shelf life. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> for a start, uh, just incredibly difficult to pick. Um, you know, they're, they're so small and delicate and fragile. So it's um, I pick them straight into a punnet so that they don't, uh, so you just handle them only the once and then um, chill them down to get the field temperature down straight into the cool room and then um, they never leave that until they get to a restaurant and they need to get to a restaurant fairly quickly and, um, and they need to use them fairly quickly too. So they're all pretty um, delicate, although I do grow other things like um, a whole lot of different plums. I've got about 30 different varieties of different plums. They're a lot more robust, obviously. And um, uh, gooseberries, I grow probably, I don't know, about eight or nine different varieties of gooseberries. They're pretty tough too, but they're they're an absolute bitch to grow, uh, to, 
to sorry to pick because you got to you know don't fall into a gooseberry bush. The the thorns are real, unbelievable. Um, I'm still I, every evening I pick all the all the all the thorns out of my fingers. So there are lots of challenges. You know, obviously the main there's the limiting factors are really labour because it's just uh, me and my husband picking. He's down picking boysenberries at the moment um, whilst I'm here relaxing, chatting. Um, the other thing is um, availability of water because um, that's a limiting factor. During the, the drought we did we ran out of water um, and had to get it trucked in just to um, keep, the, keep the plants alive. Um, and uh, the other uh, seasonal variability, obviously, is the is the main factor there because you, these are all things that you can and can't control, you know. Because we're in the Warragamba catchment, which means that we can't capture every drop of rain that falls. We have to, we can only capture a certain amount, and we must let the rest run through to go to into Warragamba Dam for Sydney drinking water. So there are limitations, basically. Can you tell us about the region? What makes it so special in regards to climate and soil for what you're doing? I'm probably the only person that decided to to come to Goulburn because I love the climate. You know, <laughs> it's um, there's not many cool enough climates with proximity to Sydney um, for your market. You have to be close to a market. Um, it's nice and cold. In um, gets down to minus twelve, not normally, but in, in a badger you can have heaps of minus twelve. So you have a you must have a, a a good chill factor to grow stone fruit and to grow um, raspberries and and um, blackberries and so forth. Um, but then you get a nice warm summer here too. So you get you know you, you, it really pushes the sugars up because that's the problem with with fruit. Um, of this sort, often grown in a cool climate, is it's you don't get the hot finish and you don't get the sugars. So people think gooseberries are real tart, but they're not. They're gorgeous. They just have the most beautiful, delicate flavour. Not over sweet. I'm not a big fan on awfully sweet fruit, but because it's not England and it's warmer, you get more sugars. So you get a much better product, I believe. Although obviously with hot winds and stuff. You, it limits some things because they do cook on the bush some some years. That's disappointing. <laughs> you mentioned that you're producing about 30 different plum varieties. Could you give us a, get, an example of a couple of them and how different plums can be from plum to plum? Oh, look, you can get purple plums, yellow plums, you can have red flesh, you can have yellow flesh. Uh, incredible different varieties. I've got slow plums, which are... Um, a different species, they're Prunus spinosa. So they're, they're tiny little things, terrible, can't eat them. But, you know, I always throw them into um, gin, you know, make slow gin. And same with the damsons, or the damsons you can eat. That's a, a different um, species as well. And then you've got your blood plums, which are gorgeous bl uh, blood red flesh. And I've got about six or seven different types of blood plums. So when you go to the supermarket, you... You buy by colour. You can have a black plum or you can have a, a yellow plum or a red plum, you know. You don't have Diagons and Damsons and um, uh, Burbanks and Elephant Hearts. You just have, you know, buy your plum by colour. And they're horrible. They're, you know, they're sour and awful. Whereas when I grow like a prune plums, you've got to get as much sugar into them as possible. You leave them on the tree as long as you possibly can to get the sugar as high as you can. Whereas, you know, your supermarket plums, good God, you can kick them around the aisles. It wouldn't make a difference. They'd be still fine. Taste terrible. <laughs> you know, but, and so that's the difference. And see, so, well, David's down there picking boysenberries now, and our fruit, uh, the boysenberries, silverberries, berries, young berries, um, marion berries, they're all a little bit softer than what you get in the supermarket because once again, you know, uh, I don't I don't grow what you can buy in the supermarket so I can't compete with Driscoll's good grief. So, you know, you grow all these different things and you pick them when they're ripe, not when, you know, 
you can sit them on a shelf for a couple of months. Oh no, sorry, a couple of weeks. Good grief. And they taste terrible. And strawberries, my God, who can eat those things? They're not strawberries. They're, they're I don't know, they're kind of cardboard cutouts, aren't they? Um, you know, if you have a proper homegrown fresh strawberry, my God, you know, you just are weak at the knees. They're just gorgeous, luscious, sweet. Not them rock hard things you buy in the supermarket that are painted red. Good grief. I don't know why people do that. It's simple to grow. Your strawberries have featured on in some of the best restaurants in Australia and particularly the Alpine strawberries have really been championed by a few chefs. What, what's so special about those? Oh, the fragrance, unbelievable. You grow a decent patch of Alpines and walk past or you don't even have to walk past, you're just in the proximity. All you can smell is strawberries and it's um, it's not like a normal strawberry um, smell because your normal strawberries are a hybrid. They're a cross between a Chilean strawberry and a Virginian strawberry um, and they've been, you know, bred to be big and luscious and sweet and they're not so sweet. They're a bit sweeter these days, I must must admit. Um, but... The Alpine strawberries are uh, Fragaria vesca and they're um, uh, like um, an improved wild strawberry and it has that wild strawberry fragrance and flavour and it's just a big boom of flavour, you know. It's, um, they're unmistakable and, and um, you know, you, you get red ones, you get white ones, you get yellow ones and they're all the different varieties. I grow, I've got about... Um, at the moment, I've probably only got about six or seven different varieties of alpines growing, mainly mainly white and yellow. But um, I've got seeds for twenty different varieties that I've been because um, I've, I've been growing them from seed and um, saving the seeds so that we don't lose all these different varieties. So that's that's kind of the other thing too is you've got to be careful when you're committed to just a commercial version of something is that you lose all those wonderful um, varieties that um, that people aren't growing commercially. So you have to be very mindful to, to save those seeds and to and to make sure that, you know, you can share them with other growers and so forth. Growing these amazing soft fruits as you do is one thing, but bringing them to market and finding a market for them is another challenge. What's that been like over the years connecting with chefs and how important are they for your products? Oh, um, I I see it as more as a as a, as a collaborative venture in many ways. Um, you work with some of the best chefs, you know, um, because they know what to do with the fruit. They know how to honour its its um, uniqueness and its flavour and its and its um, just its perfection in many ways. Um, I th- well, I'm quite lucky, really, because. I love working with um, sh- the, the you know, you, you really established important chefs, but I love talking when I deliver stuff sometimes. I love talking to the chefs in the kitchen and I often take in a whole bunch of different things for them to try because, you know, they don't get to try what a real peach is supposed to taste like, for example. So I just bring in a lot of ordinary stuff or I, bo- I bring in a whole bunch of different varieties of gooseberries or some- or sometimes and I say, look, taste all these different ones and see what you think, you know, and they're amazed. I, I like working with the young chefs as well as the, the more established, important chefs, although they're pretty pretty damn special. I, um, I'm i lucky I, I really got an entree into that world because my son's a chef and so is my, my husband's son is a chef also. And, and so, you know, I, I get to, I guess I... I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm I'm very lucky like that, and lucky in some ways. Um, but you've got to be careful too, because it was my son Terry. He was the one that said to me, "Oh, Mum, you could grow alpine strawberries." So he turns up here with a hot punnets full of these um, seedlings for me, and the next thing you know, I'm down on my hands and knees planting out all these hundreds or thousands of strawberries. So you've really got to be careful of what Terry encourages you to do. Sometimes, like you said to me one time, Mum, do you reckon you could grow hops? Stupidly, I said, yeah, great climate for it here. The soil's fine, you know, it'll be great. Next thing I know, he turns up with all these hops crowns. I don't want to grow hops, but now I've got hops strangling my raspberries because he wants to make beer. I mean, honestly, you really have to be careful of him. 
How did you get involved with, with growing fruit? Ah, uh, well, I I only cook what I like. My kids will tell you that. It doesn't matter what they want. I always cook what I like, so I always only grow what I like. I love fruit. I love I love uh, my favourite fruits are raspberries and strawberries and plums and peaches, and so that's what I grow. Um, I'll be, I, I didn't just kind of wake up one morning and think, shit, you know, I'm going to go out in the paddock and dig it up and grow some fruit, you know. <laughs> I was brought up on a, on a farm uh, down in the southern Riverina, a quite different soil, quite different climate. It was sheep, it was wheat, it was, you know, uh, cattle. It was, it was kind of, well, extraordinarily different from here. But I, I, I love the land. I love living on farms, you know, and I, and I, I spent a lot of time in between that and now um, working because I worked in the education department as a um, as a science teacher, and then I developed uh, website materials for um, for maths, for science, for agriculture, and um, and then I went into um, giving policy adv- strategic policy advice. Good grief, you know, there was one too many of these bullshit bingos at, at meetings, and they sent me over the edge, and one too many restructures. So I thought, well, you know what, I don't, I don't. Why am I doing this to myself? So. David and I um, decided to buy this farm down here and then we've got 100 acres and it's just gorgeous. You know, everywhere you look is just this gorgeous vista. So, of course, I started growing all these fruits and vegetables and the next thing you know, I had so much and so then I had to sort of start thinking, oh, geez, I'm going to need somebody to um, to fund this little, little uh, project for me. So <laughs> Terry... Um, um, Terry was at sepia at that time, so I started supplying sepia with mm. alpine strawberries and black currants and all sorts of things. And then you know, one thing led to another, and um, and um, and I've really had the privilege of, of of working with a whole range of different chefs. And you know, some of the money want a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and other things. You know, once you get to know a chef, you can you sort of say to them, you know, like a, like Ben at Aubergine, I say, Ben, I've got these. Jostaberries, and you're gonna love them. And he goes, "Am I?" Because <laughs> I know that's the flavours he likes. So I've I've sent him all these jostaberries, whereas nobody else really is into that kind of flavour that I know of. And you know, you just know what your chefs kind of like. And um, some things I grow especially for chefs, which is which I really look forward to, you know. They say to me, oh, I really like those musk strawberries. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, if I take out that patch there, I can, you know, really get going on those kind of things. So, you know, it, it, um, it's invigorating. And, you know, you've got to have a reason to get out of bed. And, um, you know, it gets the old blood pumping. I love it. Really, is, It really is, is good fun, you know. Can you take us... A- to the farm what's a typical day like uh, for you on the farm oh well you start off with all these ideas about what you're doing and the next thing you know you're out you know hoeing a patch or planting something but a typical day well you know it, it's it's extremely seasonal so this time of year is our busiest time just before Christmas because we've got um, boys and berries and young berries and silver and berries and blackberries all coming on, as well as all the the, the alpines and um, strawberries and, and all the different raspberries. So this is the kind of the time where we just pick constantly, pick 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 and sell. Um, but in winter, completely different because um, the only thing going on in winter usually is um, truffle harvest because we, we've got a little truffle patch down there as well. Um, but that's not hugely time-consuming. So then mainly, we'll see that's the problem with berries is that um, is your winter jobs are massive because you've got to cut out all your fruiting canes and, um, and then you tie up all the canes for next year. So... It's a, it's um, it take that takes months, and then there's all the got to prune all the plums, and you got to you know mulch everything, and you know it's um, it's it's pruning, it's mulching, it's fertilizing, it's all sorts of things, you know, just um, seeing to the needs of plants all day every day, which is fine, and in in summer it's all about making sure they've got enough water and so forth, so you know. 
there's a lot to do because um, I actually I knew I was in trouble. A f- an Instagram friend of mine, Attila from Canberra, he's a, he's a proper horticulturist. Anyway, he turns up and I'm showing him around. And uh, about halfway through the, the farm tour, he says, gee, this is a lot of work. And I thought, shit, you know, <laughs> the horticulturist says it's a lot of work. I'm in trouble. I'm really in trouble. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's um it's a lot of work, but I love it. You know, like I've had a lot of – and it, it's because, you know, like you, you can – all of a sudden you can think, oh, do you know what, I reckon this, this climate we grow wasabi, which we did. We grew wasabi here for about four or five years. And, um, yeah, it's the, the drought took it out. I had um, I had 500 plants and I, I – um, uh, supplied flowers and leaves mainly um and it was wonderful stuff to grow but gee whiz it's pernickety it um it's um inc- incredibly challenging when things are going well it's going fabulously well and when things are going bad it just crashes and burns but you know we all know that about wasabi we've had some pretty uh, traumatic experiences in the last couple of years whether that's um drought or bushfires or the pandemic what sort of, what sort of impact has that had on what you do oh uh, look drought drought was the 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 really tough thing for us because um we just uh, the soils here are decompan- decomposed granite and uh, the water it doesn't hold a lot of moisture um you'd think i thought imagined that we'd get more rainfall than we actually do unfortunately we don't and when that when it stopped raining, it just stopped raining, and it was brutal, absolutely brutal. Because not only did it stop raining, the hot, dry winds, my God, oh, and then the frost, so cold in winter, and then snow in October. You know, um, it was about a foot deep snow, and you think, well, that's wonderful, but it's the only source of moisture we're having for a while here. And it ruined all the fruit. So then I had to cut out all the – all the fruit was cooking on the canes, so I just cut out all the old canes and um, some beds you just decide, well, you're not going to last, you're not going to last, you're not going to last. So you stop watering those beds, then you um, strip all the – fruit off the trees to give them a chance of survival and um, then you know the highlight of your week was waiting for the water truck to turn up so that you could water stuff it's 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 in, incredible and um, horticulture doesn't get um, any benefit from the government so but we you know that's that's life don't worry about that you just roll on but it just it's just relentless you know and the bushfires well the bushfires didn't come here seriously there was nothing to burn honestly um it was shocking we we kept a lot of ground cover which was good we haven't had cattle for years because um because we couldn't feed them and we're not not going down that track um and the bushfires the the smoke here was just ridiculous. The the pollution levels were, you know, off the charts, as with as with almost everywhere else. And with the pandemic, well, that's probably the only thing that hasn't really bothered us too much because we just we just sit out here, you know. Um, yeah. In terms of, uh, and you know. You're talking to a woman that sold six trays of peaches last season. That's all, six trays of peaches. Um, So, you know, drought is brutal for us Um, and it takes 18 months for most plants to recover. So this year, whilst we're we're picking and we're happy, very, very happy, next year if if everything goes well, then it'll be a much more fabulous year. So... In fact, the pandemic was kind of in tandem with us because hospitality is, is kind of recovering, you know, um, and we're kind of recovering, so we're, we're, we're kind of recovering together is the way I see it. Your food is on um, many menus in, in restaurants. What's the best uh, iteration or dish that you've experienced in a restaurant using your 
um, fruit? Oh. Well, I've got to say, the probably the, the standout for me most most recently is um, Peter Gilmore's Summer Berries. Just the homage to the fruit, the is um, really touched me. You know, it was because it was just beautiful, um, and he didn't, you know, just stick a stick something on the top of a of a of a dessert you know put a berry on top for example it just it was just beautiful it was beautiful in simplicity i really enjoyed that one um martin ben used to do some incredible things too i i really liked what he did with the wasabi flowers on top of a little um um fish dish um it just looked beautiful and because martin is a real artist and um, he always did some beautiful things with with the the produce, but um, but I certainly was very touched with summer berries. I thought that was lovely. What what does food mean to you? You mentioned that you only cook food that you love, and you grow food that you love. Or what does food mean? Ah, uh, well, I what I most like about it is that. When we all as a family sit around and we all eat together and um, because the kids are all grown up but you wouldn't think so when it comes Christmas because I've got to cook all their favourite things, which I do, that's fine. <laughs> and uh, we, we always have the same, pretty much the same menu, which is fine. <laughs> but it's just lovely to sit around with them um, eating, you know, and very often it's after we've gone out and we've, dug up some potatoes or we've, you know, picked some peas or, um, you know, picked some, pick some um, fruit and put it on top of the, we like white chocolate cheesecake. I love it. They love it. Anyway, but the fruit always looks amazing on top. So it's, it's, it's I guess it's a, a real connectedness, particularly with family and, and friends. That's, that's really what it means. And, you know, um, the thing is with, with good food is that um, it, 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 it's always amazing. Well, it's, it sounds so self-evident, isn't it? You know, you've got to have good produce to produce good meals because you can't improve the flavour, I don't think. You know, for example, you know, like when you, if you're making jam, if you just use rubbish fruit, we, you're never going to get jam that tastes any good. You just can't make that improvement. So... I, I I think that's really what it's all about for me. Your business is very hands on, but what do you love about it? Um, well, I think sticking your hands in the dirt is really um, <laughs> it almost said grounds you, but it does. It really, <laughs> I guess that's where the term comes from. It, it um it makes you feel good, you know. And I'm, I quite like my own company, so if I don't want to talk to anybody, I just go out there weeding and stuff, you know, because who's going to say, hey, can, can I help you, you know? So you're always going to be on your own out there doing miserable tasks like weeding and, and um, you know, pruning in, in, in with a really cold wind blowing in, in winter or tying up berry canes, which are ripping you to shreds, you know. So... I just really enjoy looking after plants and I really enjoy, I don't know, I, I, love, I love the fact that you've got these teensy little seeds, you know. Look at them. You just imagine a little seed and then you, you germinate it and the next thing you know, boom, you've got this amazing plant. Now, the translation of a tiny seed into an amazing plant is incredible, you know, and then you watch that plant and you think, oh, what are your needs, you know? And you, and then you see it flower, and then you, I've got some bees here for my, my, my friend at Collectors brought me over some bees, so I, I make sure I've got good pollination. And the next thing you know, you've got fruit, and then you're back to seeds. It's just, uh, it's just incredible. I, I love that. I think it's amazing. The simple things, although it's quite complicated, I've got to say. Can you take us through the life cycle of one of your products to give us an idea of um, what it actually takes to produce um, 
from from the very beginning to when someone gets it on their plate? Oh, well, well, if we could just go with alpine strawberries. I um, I um, I used to import the seed, but now I um, I grow my own seeds, save my own seeds. But you've got to um, set up insect exclusion cages so that they don't cross pollinate to make sure that you've got the right uh, variety. So then you've got to germinate the seeds and then you've got to have like a special seedling mix perhaps and then you've got to keep it within a certain temperature range while it's germinating, make sure it's still moist all the time. Um, and then from there, then you pot them up into little pots and then you um, grow them on for about, oh, you know, maybe three, four months, maybe a little bit longer, depending on what time of year you want to do it. Then you've got to prepare your beds. So, you know, you've got to put down your compost and your manure and maybe some dotted lifter, blood and bone. That's one of my favourites. Um, and then um, put the straw mulch on top and then get the drip lines down and then plant them out. And then if you look after them and it's a wonderful year, you'll get some fruit. And then, um, yeah, then you've got to you pick it. As I said earlier, you pick them into punnets so, because they're very soft, straight into the cool room and then from the my cool room down to into restaurant cool rooms. And, um, and there you are, you know, boom, boom. It's harder if you've got to, if, you, if you've got to, um, like strawberry, alpine strawberry seeds are relatively easy to germinate. Some strawberry, uh, so, sorry, not the strawberry, but some of the, Raspberry seeds are incredibly difficult to germinate, you know. that's That takes you ages. You get your seeds, you've got to um, treat them, so you put them in um, different solutions, depends on the species, could be acidic, could be basic. Then you um, plant your seeds and then you put them into the fridge. In the, in the punnets, you put them in the fridge for three months. You get them out of the fridge after that. And then you can, um, and then you put them in the hot house, probably two, three months, and then if you're lucky, they'll germinate because it's got to pretend that it's going through a an, an animal's gut, and it's um, you know, and that that's the way it normally you can germinate a um, a raspberry. Difficult, but oh, it's good fun when they when they germinate. My God, celebration! <laughs> I'm easy pleased, aren't I? <laughs> You mentioned that you've got uh, a whole raft of seeds that you haven't used yet. Is there some that you're really looking forward to planting and growing? Always, always. Um, I've got these um, – alpines are different. Alpine strawberries are different to normal strawberries in, in many ways, and one of the ways is they don't have runners. But there's two varieties of alpines that do have runners, and one's a red, red one called a tiller. And I've got it running around underneath some um, uh, peach trees, but another one is called Hawaii Four, and that's a um, that's a, a um, an alpine that's white that has runners. So I'm looking, I'm germinating that one at the moment. I'm I'm getting quite keen to see what it's going to look like, and it's supposed to have a very good uh, flavour rating as well. Because I, I kind of work with um, a mate of mine in the states, Michael. Wellick, he is Mr. Strawberry. What he doesn't know about strawberries ain't worth knowing. Seriously, he knows everything. Um, so I email him and, and uh, we work together on a lot of stuff and he's helped me um, with the seed saving, with germination and with um, all sorts of different things. He's a, a, a you know, and that's that's probably the, the highlight of... Um, of this whole fruit growing business is that the connections that you make with people, you know, like there's a grower, uh, most, most of them, uh, like I have a specialist um, gooseberry grower friend of mine and we swap cuttings and plants in winter and I've got a, a raspberry growing friend of mine and we do the same, he's at the Mornington Peninsula. So, you know, in winter, that's what we do. We swap cuttings and seeds and it depends what, uh, people's interests are and um and how we do how how it all goes so it's 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 quite good fun you know and particularly touching was um just towards the end of the drought i had um 
uh, a lady in Katoomba, another grower in um, Tasmania, and um, uh, one in Mornington Peninsula all offered to um, send me canes and plants to replace things that didn't didn't make the drought. And that was that was really touching, you know. And and that's just what a beautiful community the fruit fruit growing people are. You know, I was really touched by that. It's wonderful. As someone who grows some of Australia's most extraordinary soft fruits and and an avid cook as well, do you have a dish that you like to cook using your fruit? Oh, <laughs> um, well, look, I've criticised chef for, chefs for just chucking fruit on top, but really that's pretty much what I do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I make, uh, I, no, <laughs> although sometimes I like, you know, like um, jelly with Prosecco or something like that and then I, you know, put pine berries uh, suspended in the jelly and uh, that's really pretty and really nice, delicious. But um, and, uh, and, uh, in winter I love... Um, I love making crumbles, you know, and I've always got in the freezer, um, you know, boysenberries or young berries or raspberries or something just to really give it some zing, you know. I don't, I don't think apples really do it for me, and uh, so that that that's um, generally what I do. Although I make a lot of jam too, gotta say, must be said, make a lot of jam. Blood palm jam—that's one of my favourites. As a massive crumble fan, um, I very much uh, I like that idea. I might try that next time I make a crumble, throw in some um, some berries and give it a bit of zing. Um, Julie, would have loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today um, to share your story. Please keep in touch and uh, we'll talk again soon. Okay. It's lovely to chat. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.